me just start by saying this is the absolute favorite part of my job, where I get to sit on the same panel with uh, Sir Fazl Hassan Abed and all these bright and young minds and just to talk about things and just to learn from all of you. Thank you so much for being here and for your time. I think we have, uh, over these two days, we have talked a lot about how do we leverage the potential of youth, how do we uh, connect them to the future and bring big bring hope and optimism for them. But I wanted to start by asking about your personal journey, because all of you in your own way has done something different. Some, you have surprised people, you have probably surprised your families, uh, your society by taking a different path. So I, I'd be very curious to know what was that exact moment where you took that leap of faith, that exact moment that made all the difference and you wanted to decide this is the life I want for myself. And I would I want to start with uh, start with maybe Zaiba. Let's start with you. Okay. Okay, firstly the fact that I'm starting this is actually putting a lot of pressure, but anyways. Um, I think my story started when uh, when I was a student and I came back so I was studying in England and I came back to Taka for uh, uh, just for the summer vacation and I decided to do an internship. So I started criminology and I thought, okay, maybe if I worked with uh, somewhere in the legal area, it would, uh, maybe this would like help my CV. I did not really think of changing anything, to be very honest. I just thought, okay, I just really need a great CV. And uh, so what happened was there, um, I was asked by my boss to do some research on women and rape in Bangladesh. And so one of the stories that I actually have, it's not, a, it's not a very nice story, but I think that what, that's what actually kind of woke me up. And what happened was, I remember I went to court and I was asking, I was interviewing a judge, and I asked the judge, uh, you know, what are the medical evidences that you need for, uh, for, uh, for the criminal justice system? You know, what, does, uh, what are the indicators? So he said, you know what, I'll just show you a piece of paper. This is, uh, someone was raped, and this, these are all the information that we need. And there I actually saw the information about a woman's body, like, a, the woman's body measurements was written, in the, was written on the paper. And I asked him, I said, you know, why is this relevant? And that's when he said that, you know, oh, of course this is relevant, because when she's in court, uh, the accused lawyer will actually say that, why will my client even rape this woman? She, uh, you know, she will. Uh, she's not even attractive. And sorry, it's really hard for me to say. And uh, that's when the woman's lawyer will actually um, tell tell the other lawyer that no, she's attractive. These are her body measurements. So, um, so after I heard that, I actually cried. I was 19 back then, and I uh, I started crying. And I went back and I said. I really need to change the way that women are perceived um, because there are a lot of uh, like a lot of things. There are there are a lot of uh, opportunities for women, but uh, some some women still don't get like obtain these opportunities because they're just not perceived that way. They're perceived as as the weaker sex. So um, so then I started. That's how I started my um, organization, and I designed a project called Project After Cover. I started teaching self defense to women. Um, in urban slums because I found out that's where they're most prone to be raped and what what it did was it actually increased the mobility and visibility of these women and decreased vulnerability and some women from our projects actually did start obtaining a lot of opportunities that they thought they never would and so that was it's not the greatest story uh, so but I think that's when I decided that I really want to change it so yes no, it's a great story because you took that moment of inspiration and now you're making a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Anand? Always start with the fact that it's not the greatest of the stories, right? But the first time I met Zaiba and she was like, we were actually interviewing each other at Prothomalo and she was like, I don't have a story. My story, it's, it's, not, it's very boring. I'm, <laughs> it's a good one. Or probably that's your hook. Oh, by the way, hi, I'm Ayman Sadiq. Since I've already shared my story beforehand in a previous session, so I'll skip that part, but the objective of running 10-minute school was to 
break those two barriers, as I've, as I've already mentioned, the economic and geographic barrier to access to quality teachers and resources. And the day I actually learned that there are actually 42.7 million registered students in Bangladesh, is that they actually got to know about the scale of crack. And as actually uh, telling that to Abit sir, like the quote that crack uses, like small is beautiful but scale is necessary, is the day I finally figured out that I can't take any other day job, I have to be here and work for Telemus. And one interesting fact still happens, uh, people still ask me, like what do you do? And I say I run Telemus School or I create videos. And after that people would also ask like, what else do you do? <laughs> because it's still not a job. And even my mother uh, still introduces me like this, oh my son, he, he creates videos. And I think, what videos? <laughs> and still uh, back at that time we didn't have a studio and my mom used to say like, I don't know what videos, I just see him getting out of the house at night and coming in the morning, I don't know <laughs> what he does. And I still find it difficult to actually introduce me what I do, because a lot of students know me, but a lot of seniors don't know me. So a few days back, I was going to a public bus, so a lot of young kids came to me rushing and took uh, selfies. Afterwards, I sat down beside a, a bit older guy, and he was like, Why <laughs> are And I was like, now I am a Korea. So and then he's like, oh, I get it. Apni modeling Korean mono. I was like, I'm modeling Korean. And then he was very curious and upset, like, what do you actually do? And I was like, I'm a bachelor de Kapore. And then he became very upset. And he he said, Bhai tale, pull up on after the selfie to like So that's my job and that's what I do. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, you know how a lot of people uh, define what they want to do and then they do it? I am the latter part of it. We started doing work and then we started defining what is it that we do. Because uh, we found that there is so much of a gap. You know, when you have a railway uh, going on a train, there is a little bit of gap between the station and the train. So it's that gap which is extremely dangerous, but we kind of overlook it. So that's where our journey started, where we said that, you know, hey, a lot of CSOs are doing so much good work, but where is it getting lost? You know, lost in translation, the money is being put in, what is happening there? And that's when we started Hackergram, where we said that, you know, we are going to work on things that are already available to us, reclaim them, uh, start from there rather than build new things and duplicate efforts we started from what we had so we started our journey by uh, working with a citizen journalism group in India that were looking to um, you know expand and do their training model so they said you know we need a space and we don't know how to go about it so we said you know there is an abandoned mushroom farm that we have and then we cleaned it up and we you know worked on the whole Thing completely from the land to water rejuvenation to growing our own food to uh, taking care of the plumbing electricity and training these citizen journalists and building that space so that's where we started and then we soon realized that the set of skills that we have can be fit anywhere whether you work with education whether you work with women there are a certain few components that are needed to get these things going and we are the people who provide that. So we will give you the data, we will give you the research, we will plan and design your projects with you, but we don't take ownership of that because in our experience, the moment you take ownership of something and you provide it free to the community, the community is then like, oh great, somebody else is running it, I don't need to do anything about it. So that's where we came in and we said we will be happy to do everything but you have to run it and that's where from where our journey started my three co-parents are all young people and i uh, I, I would like to give a vote of thanks to them for um, starting so early uh, my friend uh, bill drayton of uh, oshoka Say that most change makers start quite early. And I'm, I'm afraid I started rather late. <laughs> so at the age of 35, when Bangladesh was going through the liberation movement, I joined the liberation movement. There, there was a cyclone at the time uh, which killed 300,000 people, which suddenly made me conscious of the lives of poor people. 
and how disconnected I was with the poor people's lives. So seeing all these deaths and destruction of the cyclone first and then the war of liberation, I committed myself to saving Bangladesh's poor people's lives. So poverty elevation and empowerment of the poor became my life's work for the next 47 years. Uh, so Brad's work has been started at that time. So I was 35 at the time, but I remember the liberation movement of Bangladesh was done by you. Most of the people who were fighters, liberation fighters, were young people between the ages of 15 and 30. And all the sector commanders who were the uh, who were uh, leading them were my age. Uh, Zia Rahman was my uh, my age. We were born in the same year. Khalid Musharraf who was another sector commander. He was my classmate. Mir Shokatali was another of my classmates. So all these people were my age, the sector commanders. And they later, of course, became, uh, one became head of state, the other, uh, uh, of course, uh, were, were involved in uh, other affairs. But anyway, so Bangladesh's liberation movement, Bangladesh's freedom fight, freedom movement was, um, leadership was given by young people. Uh, and so youth is important. Only thing is that we have not thought of them so far as actors in history, in the sense that we all think of them as the youth needs good quality education so that they become a, uh, a human capital for the country to take us forward. Uh, in a, uh, so, so the country can progress. So we think of them as a means of means to an end, rather than an end in itself. That the youth themselves can create uh, changes. Uh, youth themselves can act on their own behalf. Can become actors rather than being uh, worked with. So that change needs to happen. I think the youth now needs to take on more uh, actions themselves. We think and we can think of them as an actors rather than recipient of certain uh, training, quality education. We think of how to create uh, better youth uh, output in a country. We think of high quality education will provide a better future for ourselves. Rather than thinking that they could also be part of the change makers themselves. So that's what um, I should now like to uh, work on more is that taking youth as a partner rather than youth as object to which I would like to do something with, uh, giving them better education or giving them certain skills which would take the country forward and so on. So. And that resonates very well to what we have heard throughout these two days, that the youth doesn't like being told. They would want to keep their unique self-expression. and. And Dita said something very interesting, I think, in the morning, that who are we to empower anyone? We are here to plant the seed of ideas. So that's going to be my next question, because all of you have inspired so many people, and you have really inspired through your ideas. What's your own way to plant that seed? How do you plant and bring people into the fold? How do you inspire people? Do you follow a certain uh, method? Do you have any personal way to connect to people? How do you plant that seed of IDIP? I think for me, uh, it, it's the easiest one. I just smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That works everywhere. And another thing, it's a good salam. Assalamu alaikum. In Bangladesh, I think these are the two most powerful things to make another person like you. Every auntie in my community loves me <laughs> because of the fact that I can give a very good salam and I can smile. <laughs> They're saying likability, so you have yes. to make people yes, yes. connect with them first, get them to like you Absolutely. first, and then... And, and of course, the humility part. I think, I think that's what keeps you grounded, and that's what makes others trust you. I think that's the most important part over here. Yeah. Well, I'm not blessed like Ayman. Um, but I think it's not a strategy, but I try to be friends with everyone first, and I really try to empathize. Um, I know it sounds really boring, but that is actually what I try to do. And I try to really understand their point of view. And then, and then I actually start telling them what I think. And it's just, I think my go-to is just being friends with them. Um, 
the way we work is that we do not push our agenda with the youth. We wait for people to reach out to us, tell us what they need, because I think it's extremely superficial of us to assume that somebody needs something and tell them, hey, I think you need this. And I think that's really demeaning and not the right way to probably go about it. Sometimes it is, I'm nobody to say that. But to be very honest, I think for, for us, it's when people want to change and they want to do something, they take that action. You know, people need to be, somebody needs to be at a certain level for me to pull them up. But if they're not ready to put their hands up, then I think, you know, I am nobody to tell them I can help you with this, right? So, but I would say there's a difference between wanting and need. And, and I know you always talk about going with culture. Because when we work in certain cultures, we're very conservative or whole traditional values, but we want to put forward ideas like women empowerment. There's resistance from the society or the culture. So how do you resolve this conflict between want and need and still plant an idea of change? The development is a long-term process. So it's not something that you can achieve in a day or, or a month or so on. So cultural changes takes time. So um, I remember when Yes, nearly uh, 47 years ago, uh, Bangladesh was a very poor country. One of the second, in fact, the second poorest country on earth. Uh, the poorest country was Upper Bolta. Upper Bolta is now called Burkina Faso in West Africa. Uh, but I, I used to look at where Bangladesh is at the bottom of the World Bank's list of countries with the least amount of resources. And uh, I remember that. Bangladesh used to produce 10 million tons of rice, and we we had 74 million people at that time, and we were always three three million tons short. We so Bangladesh's agriculture had to produce more in order to feed its feed its population. Bangladesh's population was rising very fast. Our women used to produce 6.4 children. So unless we do family planning and cut down family size, it'll go on unsustainably high population, so which we would not be able to feed. People would remain poor. So we had to work on many different areas, agricultural development, livestock, fisheries, to produce more. We used to, we had to do family planning, healthcare, child survival. We also realized that the children die so, far. so you know, a quarter of our children die before the fifth birthday. So if you have more children dying, then if mothers will have more children. So all kinds of things had to be worked out, worked on. So first child survival, then family planning. So I remember in 1979 was the International Year of the Child. And I thought that what could BRAC do in order to really have an impact on child mortality? So we took up a program to go to every household in Bangladesh and teach mothers how to make oral rehydration fluid at home with salt, sugar, and water so that diarrhea doesn't kill their children. More than half children get died of, of diarrhea. So we did that over a 10 year period from 1980 to 1990. So we went to 14 million households and teach mothers one to one how to make oral dehydration to it. And that had a big impact on, on infant mortality reduction. And then also in the, in the, from 85 to 90, we took up immunization of children. So uh, the government took one half and the other half was taken by Bragg. And we immunized all children. We took the immunization coverage from 2% in 1985 to 72% in 1990. So that kind of things we did. And it had an impact on child mortality reduction. And then we had more success with family planning program with women. So fertility started declining too. So now we have fertility has declined from 6.4 to 2.1. We, our child mortality has come down from 252 per thousand to, to 38. So that kind of dramatic decline has happened because of the kind of work we did. And it had an impact on, on the population uh, growth in Bangladesh. And then the other thing that government as well as the other, other actors have done is Bangladesh's population has risen now to 170, nearly 170, about 2.3 times that we had in 1947-1972. But our food production has gone up from 10 million tons to 37 million tons, 3.7 times. As a result, our 
food availability per person is higher. Our productivity in many different, uh, different fields have gone up dramatically. And that had a big impact on Bangladesh's uh, development in terms of economic as well as social development. Our literacy rate used to be 25 percent, now it's more or less 70 70 percent. So all kinds of things happened in Bangladesh, which we can take some uh, credit for, uh, which we would not have been would not have happened if we, if many of us, including the government, the private sector, the social sector, everybody collaborated to do this. So, um, so it is it is important to. Um, do the right thing at the right time. The time, at that one time we thought that getting children into school, giving them a literacy is important. But now we are thinking of how about quality education? How do we provide quality education so that the next generation of young people are who are going to age dramatically? And that had a big impact on Bangladesh's development in terms of economic as well as social development. Our literacy rate used to be 25 percent, now it's more or less 70, 70 percent. So all kinds of things happened in Bangladesh, which we can take some uh, credit for, uh, which we would not have been, would not have happened if we, if many of us, including the government, the private sector, the social sector, everybody collaborated and to do this. So, um, so it is, it is important to. Um, do the right thing at the right time. The time, at that one time, we thought that getting children into school, giving them a literacy is important. But now we are thinking of how about quality education? How do we provide quality education so that the, the next generation of young people are, who are going to, a, going to need to navigate through uncharted waters, they don't know what kind of jobs they're going to be able to, going to need to do in the future. Because I understand in the next 30 years, the 60 percent of the jobs that would be done by people we don't don't do not even exist now. It will be completely new kind of job. So what kind of training or education we need to give our young people so that they can deal with the uncharted waters, try and solve problems of the future, and and become uh, effective and efficient as operators in these new jobs. So these are uh, aspects that we we think is important the kind of education that we need to provide to be able to do that. It's not just learning for a government job, and the government job is not going to remain the same. This is going to be quite different in the future. So, so our young people need to go through a lot of different experiences to be able to do that. Absolutely. And speaking about future, Zaiba, you were talking about perception and especially perception of parents and expectation of society and how that creates barriers for youth. So you have all actually redefined what success means to each of you, right? Not salary, not job, something different. So I'm curious to know how do you define success for yourself when you consider I've had a good day? Uh, success for me is when someone actually comes up to me and tells me, that they have, like they did, like someone else's success is success for me. So when someone from my project goes, um, goes out and then comes and calls me and tells me that this is exactly what I did. I stood up to, um, I stood up, I stood up to this person who was harassing me, or I stood up for someone else. For me, that's that's what success is. Uh, someone else's uh, just seeing your project evolve to other people and someone and other people without you telling them, they're going around and kind of. Um, spreading this movement themselves. I, I would agree. Sometimes it feels great when someone comes to me. I visit Dhaka University quite often to take a few sessions, and I oftentimes have a few people coming to me and saying, well, I didn't have money to have my coaching, but I learned from 10 minutes school, and here I am at Dhaka University. So that gives me a great hope. And sometimes locking a few sponsors gives me a big hope. <laughs> Next few months secured, so yeah. I think uh, for us, I, I think for all of us, I think working in this sector, working with people, this is where, where our real victory lies, you know, like for me, when people come for, like I was talking about previously in my session, Chai Pe Charcha, when you have a heated argument about, you know, between two people of different castes and, you know, they're talking about very different things, 
and they leave, they, they, they make sure they finish their tea and then they, you know, rush out of it. But they come back tomorrow for a new discussion with somebody. I think that's what victory for me means for this, that people, the fact that somebody is still open to, you know, um, hearing different uh, uh, point of views and understanding, like you may not have to agree with it, but as a Dulces people who are, you know, who work in this sector, we should, we should have that space, you know, that safe space where somebody should be allowed to say something, what they want to say, and we don't necessarily have to get offended by it and not take ourselves so seriously. So when people are able to look beyond themselves and beyond their ego and say that, hey, you know, we had a heated conversation, doesn't matter, I'm ready for another one, I think that's where the real victory lies. I, I, I heard yesterday that somebody said that today's young people are not interested in politics or governance and things like that, which uh, earlier generations were. I would say that um, historically, I was born in British India, so it, we were colonized as a nation. So, so a part part of the, uh, growing up in a colony, or a British colony, and then a half colony of Pakistan. So we were much more aware of the kind of society we live in, and and we wanted to rule ourselves. So that was that was the historical um, necessity made us more aware of our role in politics. I mean, we did think about who runs our country, who, who should. So now this is not true. So when I went to England at the age of 18 to study, I found that the British uh, young people in the university were not thinking about politics at all. They were thinking more how to find truth. <laughs> so they were looking for truth. <laughs> so. Uh, it was quite different because we had different kind of cultures from which we went. I went from a colony or almost a cultures in a particular context, but not necessarily now. Now that we are independent ourselves, so most people are not in looking at politics, but looking at development and how to change society and so on. But uh, uh, but I think the existentialist problems of today is climate change. So if existentialist change for me as a youth was a, to get out of the colonial rule, today's youth should be concerned about climate change because the, fu the youth's future will be affected very much with climate change. The climate change or impact of climate change will be felt by them more than I would. I am at the age of 82 we don't, we don't be too worried about climate change now. But people who should be worried is your generation, the youth, who should be, this is an existentialist issue for, for the youth of today. And I don't see the kind of consciousness, kind of uh, behavior that uh, the other day I read a story about a girl trying to organize a whole town in Sweden uh, to change their behavior. The, unless we change the human behavior in, in terms of consumption, the way we consume our uh, resources, it, it's unsustainable. We need to do something about that. So I would say that the existentialist issue today for the youth would be climate change to do something about conserving our planet, uh, conserving our resources so that the planet survives. So this is very important, and I, I would like to see more youth involvement in, in that respect, in climate change and issues to conserve the, the resources of the planet. So sustainable development is very important. To, to get youth to be engaged or to care about these causes, I guess what Dipta was saying, that to create that open space, that safe space. So what helped in your background what worked as a catalyst? Was there, do you think family plays a role or teachers play a role or society plays a role? So what are the positive stimulus that really pushes someone to be more empathetic or more caring for the causes? Was there something in your background, something that we can learn from that this helps? Okay. Uh, <laughs> there, I, I think there are a lot of reasons uh, 
since I go to a lot of places inside and outside Dhaka city, uh, if I talk about the youth, they are heavily influenced by the pop culture, the popular culture that we see. Anything that is cool, they'll jump into that bandwagon. So if you see social media, anything that's cool, people are sharing that. Doesn't matter if it's good, if it's bad, if it's trolling, or if it's like straightforward, vindictive What's the attitude towards of that. Cool? I think it, it, that is the one thing, that is one part that changes. The popular culture changes. Sometimes on social media, doing good stuff is cool, and then trolling is cool, and then something else is cool. For example, I, I asked, I used to say this a lot. Uh, anywhere and everywhere I go, I used to tell people, like, do, do, do this simple act of kindness. Give salam to the people who don't usually get salam. The, the rickshawala mama, the CNG mama, the tonger dokandar, the security guard that we have, the maid that works in your place. And suddenly, because I can s connect to the students well, I made that cool. And after that day, I see hundreds of people taking a photograph with the rickshawala mama, uh, tagging me and saying like, I, mean, I did that and guess what? I saw an amazing smile uh, in that rickshawala mama's face and that made my day. So that became cool. And, and that only lasted a few days, of course. <laughs> but so that's my question to, I guess, all of you, that how do you make that coolness sticky? How do you make that sustainable, that what Abed Bhai was referring to? How do you make that behavior stick? Um, okay. Uh, okay, so actually adding on to this cool thing, um, so, what happened with, uh, uh, so what happened with me was, although the community that I work with are not very familiar with social media, but what we did was we actually increased visibility of what the message that I wanted to pass. So uh, when we started teaching self-defense um, to these girls, what we, uh, what we actually saw that actually ha happened organically was that you know, there were girls who had boxing gloves around their neck and they were coming in and they're walking into um, to a hub in, our, in the slums. And some people got, they, were, they became really curious and they were wondering, okay, so you know, what's going on? Oh, what is this? And a lot of other people, they were just curious. So what happens is like, at first, when you, you pass on, you, you know, you increase visibility, and then when someone, it catches someone's eye, they become curious, and then that's how the whole cool factor starts, because they just want to be part of this too, but they don't really know why. Great, so you have to make people curious. Yeah, and that's for yeah. Great. Okay. I think, um, I'll just go a little bit away from the cool uh, coolness of the topic. Um, I think, uh, you know, my experience of living in villages uh, has told me whenever I've interacted with people, they, um, at the very grassroots level, there is this hopelessness that we just saw in the survey here that has seeped into these communities where they feel, what can we do? I am an individual, I live in a village. Like, I'll give you a very interesting example. When I uh, moved into the, re, uh, the last village that I was living in, I met a girl who was my neighbor, she was 15 years old, and she came to say hi to me, and I said, hey, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And she's like, what do you think I'm going to be? And I'm like, that's a very interesting question. And she said, you know, I'm a 15-year-old girl from India, from a village, nobody cares about me. I'm going to get married and get away from the village where I have to, you know, carry pails of water every day. I'm not doing that. So she got married when she was 16 and she was very happy with that choice. Now, for the life of me, I could not think of an answer to give to her where she was so root, deep rooted in her reality, where even the thought of an ambition was laughable for her. Right, so I think as people who do this work, I think it's very important to make every individual feel that you can be that change because I, who am I? I'm nobody, I'm sitting here like with people who are doing such amazing work. If I can be here, anybody can be here, right? And that's the message that I feel should go out to people to f make them feel that you are equally important and equally able to do something. Maybe you haven't thought about it yet, and that's where you put in the seed, right? You put in the seed and you say, maybe you haven't thought about it, and I'm not you know, forcing you to think about it, but maybe think about it. And you've done that, right? And that person will then go back and think about it, but like at that time, I didn't have so much thought. I was just so flabbergasted by what she said. But I think as 
people who do this work, it's really important to make individuals feel that your thoughts, your opinions matter, and you should feel that you are powerful enough to change other people's thought in your family, but you have to stick with it. You can't just raise your voice today and say, I did it once, nothing happened, so I'm stepping back. So that's where people like us come in and keep reminding them, you can do it. What did you think? Did you do something about it? And you know, pester them a little bit, little bit, so but be don't persistent. force them. Yes, be persistent. And they, people, you know, even for us, when we do this work, we feel so hopeless from time to time that it doesn't make any difference. But it does, doesn't it? You know, and that's what we need to tell people, that if you have a thought that you think is, you know, important, share it. It doesn't matter. And if you get a backlash for it, we are standing with you to go through with it. I want, Avatya, I want to take a question from the audience. There's an in interesting question here which says that youth are traditionally not perceived as experts. Hence, youth are traditionally not seen as experts. They're seen as naive, not having enough experience. Hence, their voice are often left out. So how do we solve this structural problem? How do we ensure that our structure, system, policy making are more inclusive and create space for youth voice? I think, I think we are not quite ready uh, in our societies to give youth the kind of uh, chance uh, or kind of um, uh, place, kind of um, opportunity to play the leading role. And I think this is the change that we need to make in our society. Personally, uh, <clears throat> I was thinking of um, sustainable development goals that we ha now have the 17 goals that we need to um, achieve by 2030. Um, I just don't see how we can attain this if we don't mobilize the youth to participate in the whole process. Um, the number one goal is, is eradication of poverty in the world. It's the first time in human history that we are bold enough to say that we want to eliminate poverty by in the next in our in a, in a generation, unless we mobilize this, all our resources, including the youth, we will not be able to achieve that. So that's the reason. That's the reason I think the sustainable development goal needs to be needs to mobilize the youth for getting into the um, into the implementation of sustainable development goals. Um, secondly, I think uh, we have not been able to explore the kind of resource youth can bring to the table, and I think I think that has has to be done now. Uh, so I hope that uh, the change we need to make in our society to think of youth as a only to do something with rather than bring bring them as actors in history that has to be done. So I hope that uh, that change we can bring about in the, within our societies in a way that the youth can participate effectively in the development of the country. Um, I'll just take from what Jasir said. I think there is also a huge disconnect between how we perceive children. We see, we had this discussion in our group that you know when when you have when you're talking to children, you're dealing with them like, uh, o to ki jane na. But you know, these children are going to grow up and become youth, and then you will suddenly expect them to you know, change the world, whereas you never gave him that acknowledgement or responsibility to say that you know, what you're saying makes sense. So I think that needs to change. I think we need to look at children as young adults who are going to grow up and do something you know, useful rather than today your children and tomorrow you're going to grow up and there is no you know, transitioning that is happening. What made you, yeah, young people, such confident, outspoken, bold? So what happened? Did, did, was there something in the family upbringing? What inspired you? Um, I think the story that I, uh, I mentioned before about how I had this realization. So for me, it was a tragic story that just made me break down and realize what I'm really passionate about. Um, so my experience. And I know, um, uh, I'll go back to, uh, changing perception and often how society or parents or even neighbors or relatives in Bangladesh come in the way. So I mean, I'm sure being an IBA graduate, you were supposed to follow a certain path. So when you 
completely veered off that path. They were negative comments, I'm sure. How did you handle that? How do you rise above that? Those were so common that I stopped bothering about them. <laughs> My father is a defense officer. He used to be he retired one year back. So one advantage of being a uh, army family is the TNT number has only four digits. <laughs> and it's free. So aunties always talk to each other. It was so common phenomenon in my place that it never bothered me, actually. So, Abhithe, there's a question from you from the audience, which says, uh, what did you do right when you were young that you were able to sit here today and found, found this wonderful organization like Brad? <laughs> so what did you do right? I don't know what, what I did right uh, when I was young, but I, I chose a profession which sort of was quite solid. I was a chartered accountant. So, so that gave me a, a worry-free kind of existence as a, uh, as a corporate executive. But then when time came that I felt that I had, I had a complete disconnect with the people of this country and the poverty didn't touch me at all. And I became very concerned about that. And I wanted to be connected with my people. And that connection led me to leave everything and do something that would change Bangladesh. So thank you. There's another question about uh, visibility and impact and uh, where should today's youth focus more and why? I guess it's impact, but I want to be more interested about how that how do we make our youth focus more on impact rather than, I guess, superficial visibility or coolness that doesn't stick? I think uh, one, one uh, very critical thing that I've seen outside of Dhaka, the, the youth has immense energy, right? Now, if you don't direct that energy towards a right option, it's derailed. They'll eventually use that energy to, uh, by doing something bad or something just wasteful. The problem is, beyond the academic curriculum, there's no one in the society or his surroundings to mentor him, to tell him what to do, apart from the education. I haven't seen many teachers mentoring the students beyond the academics. I haven't seen seniors going up to the juniors and mentoring them how this thing is done. I haven't seen a lot of extracurricular activities seen growing up outside of Dhaka. So I think. If that scene is changed, if, if you can utilize that energy towards the right direction, I think something really good can come up with this. And I also always try to give them ideas uh, about what they can actually do in, in their uh, lazy time. But the problem is the people or the students who are outside of Dhaka regard the students who are in Dhaka as aliens. Like, you have big privileges, we don't have it, and we have this you know, excuse mentality that actually restricts us. So yeah, I, I think there are two we ways of it. to find common ground maybe, that how we are similar and not so much different. That's one, and number two, I think the teachers, the instructors have a huge role to play. The universities have a huge role to play. I think university's biggest role is to make people employable. It's true, but I think they are failing in that part in quite Big extent, <laughs> I would like to say that. I think that that's where the missing link is. I think our education curriculum is still based on the, uh, the second uh, uh, industrial revolution. We're not even, we haven't yet touched the third industrial revolution, let alone the fourth one. So I think it's a huge mismatch of how you can actually utilize the energy of the youth. If uh, I may answer that question, I think, please, uh, I'm, I don't mean it in anything. Visibility or impact, where should today's youth focus more and why? Well, you should just focus on working, I believe. You know, because impact can be really like, you know, the problem with that is that, you know, we are so driven by numbers and we are so driven by this is what we've done and this is what we've achieved. And uh, visibility, again, it's like, a, you know, it's, it's like a lost message sometimes when we do a lot of work and we want to be visible, but we may not have done that work. So I think we shouldn't be worried about visibility because with social media as a tool, I think you can be visible. And if you have the right kind of people who believe in your work will share it. But 
you know, don't worry about your visibility. People are watching you anyway, and you're already putting your work out there. And don't worry about impact, because you know how great your work is, because these people, your community is coming back to you and telling you what you're doing. So I don't think they should worry about either. I think just keep working, and yeah, I think you will get both. So seek for validation, not in the likes and shares, but as you said, someone coming up to you and saying that you have changed my life. Um, for me, visibility or impact kind of uh, reminds me of what came first, chicken or the egg. Um, because with because I don't know what actually comes first. If you're visible, then I feel like you're able to influence a lot of people in a positive way. Therefore, Im there, therefore you might have a lot of impact. But then again, if you have a lot of impact, then you're also visible. So I think... Um, even yes, you, I do agree with uh, what you just said, and but if it, if I were to answer that question, I would say maybe fifty, uh, maybe actually focus on both, uh, because I know people do tend to get carried away. But I've also found out, like I've also found out, like as um, even in the presentation, um, they mentioned that youth are youth, no, not enough youth actually have role models. So if we can actually have visible, proper role models, um, I would. Like, I would think that that would actually work as something positive for the future. Absolutely. And I, th I can do this all day, but unfortunately, we are short on time. So I just wanted to wrap up asking one question. All of you in your designation have founder, right? You have started something. You have created something. But being a leader, how important has been your team as well? Because often founder, creator seen as seen as one person. So how important is team and how, what has been your leadership style? How do you inspire people? And Abadha, you have created this whole inspiration at BRAC of 100,000 and more people and all of you. So what's your leadership style? My, my leadership style has been not to emphasize, <laughs> emphasize myself at all, to create an organization where everybody feels that they are important and they are leading. So I wanted to create lots of leaders, not just one leader. <laughs> so yeah, this was important. Zaiba Ayman. I, I completely agree with that. Um, just, uh, just to add to that, my, uh, my style is also, um, firstly, when I started, um, I think founder is just something that I think I had to write legally, <laughs> in legal papers. But when I started, I just started with um, just being friends. Just I was friends with my, I just made it team with a bunch of friends who felt the same way about solving the same problem. And uh, then we went on to create more leaders. I'm still trying to figure out the answer. <laughs> then I, <will. laughs> I think um, it's, it's, it's very important, like Sir said, that you know, you, I have come here because you know, my team is working on something else, and that's the importance of team that because I have a team, I can sit here and you know, have this discussion. But uh, as people who who founded something, I think we give ourselves too much importance because none of this would fly if you wouldn't have a team, if people didn't believe in what you were doing. And I think as people who start something, the only, I think, idea that we want to keep holding on to is what we really believe our principles are. Except for that, we don't want to tell people how they want to work, because then there is no difference between us and somebody else, right? So as long as you know your team is doing what, the reason they're your team is because they believe in what you believe in. And if there is a little problem there, then you know, as, as a team, you should come together and rework those negotiations, renegotiate those understandings, and work from there, because uh, I don't think uh, it's right to say that you know somebody who's founded something, it, it's only his vision or her vision. It, other things keep getting added to it. You keep, uh, you know, uh, it's like a package that you open and you think there's something inside it, but there's something totally different. You start with an idea, but it just, you know, uh, organically grows, evolves in a way that, uh, and it becomes something totally different. And it's never you alone. It's it's people who are working with you. And you know, people say it's very offensive when you say that they're standing behind you. I think it's really important because if I'm falling, I'm falling behind and I need people to catch me there because I can't see behind, I can see forward. So my team is standing behind me and without them, I can't do any of this. And I think it's true of all of us sitting, sitting here. 
That was a very comprehensive answer. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I think uh, if I'm to pick a unique part, I think since it's a still a very small team, I still like to mentor them on a personal level. This is something that I like doing. I like teach people. <laughs> so I think that's one part that is a bit different uh, from other people. I think that's one thing that I focus on. I think we have to wrap up. I, I really want to thank uh, Abid Bhai and all our panelists for your wonderful conversation, wonderful insights. You know, when we look at the world, there's so much to be sad about, and there's hopelessness, there's sadness, there's conflict. But at the same time, we live in the world where there are beautiful minds and ideas and inspirations. We live in a world where there's Sarfaz Lehasan Avid. We live in a world where there's Zaiba, Ayman, and Dipta. So there's a lot to be hopeful about, and that's, I guess, the message we need to give to the youth, that there is optimism, there is hope, and the future is bright, and you all are shining examples for that so thank you so much for inspiring us inspiring generations to see hope and see future and see light thank you so much mm -hmm.